Let me start with a personal remark. Uh, I have a year and a half old daughter. And when she was born this year and a half ago, I learned a couple of things about the world around me and about myself. One of those was uh, that multiple people uh, feel compelled to share with me some opinions. Opinions how to dress my daughter, how to uh, grow her up, how to behave her like that. And at the beginning, I felt pretty irritated for all those opinions. I was hearing them and saying, okay, 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 okay. No. But over time, I learned to value them. I understood that they are actually sharing their stories with me and giving me some insight into uh, what they learned uh, and their experiences. And I understood that this is actually a topic of love and, uh, and, and care towards myself. And this talk is a little bit like the same thing. I would like to share with you uh, some of my experiences and some of the things uh, that I found important in my, in my professional career. And paraphrase the uh, Asian saying, sharing is caring, like sharing is also to learn. So I would love to hear afterwards some of the comments how you do uh, things uh, at your uh, place of work. So what's the excuse for this talk? Uh, the excuse is uh, that three years ago I really wanted to join a joint company, and I did that. I decided, okay, I want to work in an agile environment, I will join the best agile company that will accept me. There was a good chemistry between me and this company, so I came in and, and, and they accepted me, they thought, like, okay, this is a great guy, let's, let's get, get him on, despite the lack of experience. And on my first day, I was very disappointed about the environment I'm working in. I thought that agile company, the great people I was talking with, uh, could shoot, shoot and will work in that amazing environment with great test coverage, with a uh, quick deployment, <coughs> and everything working just fine. It wasn't the case. It was totally not the case. We had a one monolithic code base that was modified by multiple teams on two continents. We were constantly stepping on each other's toes. Uh, the build of this uh, monolith was taking ages. Just to run it, it took extra 40 minutes. And only if I were in the office. If I tried to run this code base outside of the office, it would take a couple of hours. Working with it was disastrous, difficult, and, and, and just terrible. And deployments happened every second week. Uh, and that meant that actually from the idea to deployment, it could take twice as long to get things into production. Usually a month was the estimate to make any reasonable change. Right now, it's totally different. Uh, over this, the course of the last three years, everything changed. I now profoundly enjoy working in the environment I am in. We do deployments multiple times a day, as we hear like multiple people uh, saying that in the previous presentation. Same thing happen happening in, in my company right now. Uh, building and, and, and deploying things is happening very, very quickly. Uh, it's a matter of seconds, not a matter of 40 minutes. And, and finally, I, I can work remotely. Because of all of this, uh, I can work at my home office, and it's, 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 it's working brilliantly for me. And the thing I attribute this, this, this vast change over the, the, the course of the last few years is a couple of little practices. I think that little steps we take, took uh, over this, this period made, 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 made a great cultural changes uh, and technical changes of flow into our environment. And in this talk, I will skip all the basic stuff, all the things that, that, were, that are mentioned, mentioned very, very often during the talks. I will focus on the things that, that really worked for us well, and that were the, the, the distinguishing factors uh, for me. Um, I'm really happy to hear that during the talks over here, a couple of those were actually mentioned. So, so uh, I won't reference the talks that were happening in this room previously, but some of those things I wanted to share with you during preparing this presentation are already spread across the community in different talks, and that's, that's making me very happy for you. So, who I am, I'm Martin Dositlo, I'm just an engineer in my company, I'm nobody special, but I not only witnessed all those changes, I also was enabled to be part of it. And I was actually uh, initiating some of the initiatives I will be describing them. Some of them were just my ideas, uh, some, some were ideas somebody else I was looking on and helping to, to develop. Uh, but the nice thing was that being just a regular member of the, of the company, I was able to make a uh, significant impact on how the way we work. Oh, I should join the conference, okay. Uh, and then to talk about our, my, my, my company, my organization. Mm -hmm. 
we are restaurant preservation uh, company. We have two two products. One is the consumer related, which is a website basically for people to come in and make reservation for a table in a restaurant. The other one is for the restaurant, where we uh, build a product for restauranters so that they can take care of the bookings of the floor and so on and so on. And our engineering is spread across uh, three continents. We have offices in the uh, United States, Europe, and, and, and India. And, and the way we currently work is with the, with the microservices. Each team owns their own uh, set of the features and, and, and deploys them separately as a microservices. And many of the things I will be mentioning here are a little bit specific to the microservices and to, and, uh, and to the issues that microservices create in an environment. The structure of the talk is uh, around our deployment pipeline, more or less, and as you can see, it's very much dev uh, oriented. It starts with code, that's, that's how I do it. Uh, but I don't like to be called, uh, I don't like to be uh, called coder. I'm actually not, I'm an engineer. And there is a vast difference in that, because as an engineer, I can influence and I know how to, how, uh, make educated decisions on what should be done and, and how it should be done. It's, I, I really don't like somebody coming with me with a feature request. I much rather that people come with the why they want to do it. Because this tremendously helps me to shape the, this, this feature uh, requirements and, and what we can do. And with the why, I can decide myself what are the minimum uh, set of code changes uh, that are necessary to be able to perform this file. I can also design what needs to be uh, to happen to be able to track this file, to track to measure whether the change we are doing is actually uh, taking place. Uh, so with this approach, with this trust into, into engineers that they will share, shape the features, they will change the, the things that are requested, uh, we found out that often the, the, the requirements are being much, much simplified. We are, the, we are focusing on the, on the things that are easiest to achieve, faster to get to, get to the market, but deliver the same value and, and allow us to get the same learning. Not only that we uh, limit on the scope, we, often, uh, we also do put off 20% of the engineering time uh, as a kind of slack time. Uh, no product managers, no, no managers in general, uh, rule this time. It's that's only who decide on this one. And that's one of the things that really, really makes me passionate. That's something I could basically talk on hours and hours uh, how great it is. The baseline for this is that it empowers people who are notoriously ignored uh, to shape the direction. Engineers in this 20% time can build something and prove it working to the business. Some of us improve the process. So they fix the pipelines, they make the pipelines to be more efficient, to automate them. Uh, some improve the quality uh, of the product, despite we do it like on a daily basis, developing things. Sometimes you want to do the, the, the more involved with cleanup, and this 20% time enables that. Finally, uh, it enables some individuals like me to innovate in the product itself. And one particular thing I like to boast about is that in the last three months, I managed to, to, build, to pair build with, with the colleague uh, to experiment the actual experiments on the product that improve revenue of the company, uh, making the company earn twice my salary, uh, like improve this, the revenue twice my salary. So I basically proved them that it's worth to, to, to have me there. Okay, so that was about the coding. Uh, I, I said I'm, I'm not focusing on the actual craftsmanship movement and this, this stuff there. The craftsmanship mentors are doing it much, much better. Uh, but the engineering side is, is, is tremendously important. Once the feature is, is ready to be, uh, to be released, to, 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 it needs to reach the, the main branch that, that will be released. It needs to be merged into main branch. And the core thing for this is that it never gets merged by a single person. It's all, always either per program, and then naturally two people look at it and both agree that it's good enough, or somebody else will review the code before it gets merged into the main, main code base. And that again has, has a number of, uh, of great, oh, yes, a uh, number of great uh, benefits for us. 
Uh, first of all, it's, it's a gateway for the quality, because engineers know how the quality of the code looks like. So, so, so they will be passionate about it, and they won't agree to merge something that, that doesn't match the, their quality level. Also, it shares inside of the team uh, our own skills. Somebody actually takes time to read my code, uh, to reflect on it, and, and to say what, what, what could be improved. Tremendous thing to improve my own skill set. I'm learning from basically every team member in my, in my team. Uh, thirdly, we protect ourselves from creating silos. Now multiple people can work on the different feature set because we are all at least looking at them and, and, and taking care of those. Uh, we are protecting ourselves from the so-called like basket effect. If basket is one of the of the devs, uh, one of the engineers, uh, others can easily pick up this work. It's not a single silo knowing about this uh, this particular feature set. And 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 a, and a similar fashion that, that that helps a lot in the spread of the knowledge. Once we merge it, once it reaches the the the, the, the main code base. The rest of the steps is pretty much automated. They will, they will happen uh, automatically, step up after step, without our intervention. intervention. So we first run into CI environment, environment to check about for, 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 the, for, for the simple things like unit tests, checking the style. Then we actually run it uh, to check that the configuration is working fine, that uh, there is nothing uh, missing uh, in case of like it actually can stand up and, and start responding. And, and we test. We run our acceptances against uh, against that environment. And if I can share with you a little set of uh, failures of the things we, the problems we create for ourselves with testing, then please don't share it too loudly with other people. Like I don't like to uh, say things that we do is wrong. Uh, but carry on. That's that's all. Uh, first of all, we started with a huge set of tests. We really believed in test, and we thought that like, acceptance testing is the, is the best way to test it, because uh, acceptance testing uh, is ultimate truth about how the product is, uh, is performing. We can basically test it uh, from the perspective of the user. So we created a whole big set of tests. We had actually we had actually dedicated tester at the time who helped us to, to create even more of those. And with this huge uh, set of tests, we felt pretty confident that whatever we are releasing is, 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 is well done. The problem is, was that we spent more and more time uh, maintaining those tests. We, we were not slacking on creating those. We were actually focusing on getting good quality for those tests. Uh, there was, there was no uh, like duplicated code over there. Uh, we were trying to get them as reliable as possible. Still, the uh, number of dependencies for the acceptance test were causing us more and more trouble. So at the first opportunity, uh, we tried a different approach. We focused on the tests that were the, gave us the most value. So we tried to find this 20% of the tests that gave us 80% of the trust into what, that whatever we are releasing uh, is good. And that helped us tremendously. Like we, we basically, by writing lots of tests, uh, we get ourselves a burn that we don't want to write too many acceptance tests. Because acceptance tests are the ones that are most expensive to maintain from the whole set. Second thing, uh, trying to mimic the actual user behavior, we are not focusing so much on the speed. We are trying to solve the speed in a different ways. Trying to run tests in parallel, uh, using Selenium grid to get them, uh, get them running. Still, all those things meant that the tests <coughs> were not really fast, especially with the big set of those. They, they were taking lots of and lots of time to run, which also meant that we are often ignoring them from the desktop perspective and allowing our CI environment to run them. So we are basically depending on the CI environment, which had all those uh, parallel running capabilities, uh, which dev machines didn't have, to run them for us. Uh, this frequently started to, 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 to lead to CI environment getting, getting failed, because we were not checking it even like in a simple manner on our local machine. So the second, second, second thing that we really did get wrong was not running any acceptance tests on our local machines. It didn't happen like over, over, overnight. It was happening day after day. The tests were getting slower and slower and slower, and the less often we were running them on the local machine, uh, which meant that the CI, number of CI failures was rising up and up and up. Uh, and again, the, th the thing we learned was that 
just limiting number of, of the tests and making some of them at least faster, compromising on the, on the quality of the test by, for example, using headless browser instead of a real browser. So we don't really test that, that the same way as user procedures. Gives us a speed that's needed uh, to be able to run it even in the local machine uh, on the depth, uh, yeah, the depth environment. Third one, this one didn't happen for a long time and basically was touched on the previous, one, the con previous presentation. Uh, this, the applications we were writing had multiple dependencies. In my case, it was Surge API. So I could, as you can imagine, Surge depends on, on all the different pieces of information to be able to make them searchable for all, all, all the other uh, people in, in the company. So we had so many dependencies that our tests were slowed down by those dependencies. Yeah, CI, the CI environment not being exact match of the, of the production environment, being run on the, on the store machines, was part of the problem here. But in general, we are on the mercy of other teams' uh, performance, on other, of other teams' uh, data quality, how, how their data work in CI. It was really, really painful. The one of the worst things that can happen is the test failing not due to your changes. So you are just happily coding your new changes. And some, somebody else changes something in the, uh, uh, in the testing environment, and your test suddenly starts to fail. That's very, very irritating. So the thing we did was uh, we mocked out all the dependencies. So our acceptance tests currently run against the mock versions of the, of the agents. Agents that the, the, the part of the code that is supposed to go to the, uh, to the actual dependency for testing purposes is not doing that. It's just presenting back the most data uh, to, to ourselves. And this helps a lot with the speed, because more data obviously is, is much faster. Uh, this helps a lot with the reliability of the test, because we are now in full control of the data that we are getting back. And yeah, and that's, that's something we learned to do very, very quickly. And uh, yeah, it also helps with development, because right now uh, I can disconnect my machine and be able to run tests locally because I have no dependencies for anything uh, outside of my, uh, my own service. And the fourth, the fourth thing we learned was uh, with this huge set of tests, we felt really confident that our service and our code is running correctly. And it proved not to be the case. We started to get failures, not during deployment or just after them, but six hours after the deployment, in the middle of the night, operational issues started to bite us back. We had too much confidence to testing, and we had too little coverage of the monitoring. This is something that the guys about the testing in production said exactly, exactly well. Uh, deployments are only discrete moments in the life cycle of, of your service, and you still need to know that, well, that's, that, that the service is correctly working between those discrete moments. So uh, other problem was that we, we too much trusted testing and, and did too little monitoring uh, in an actual production environment. So we passed the tests. It's looking good. Uh, we are we're getting on the right, 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 right path. Uh, we're getting into the pre-prod environment. The pre-prod environment, in our case, has uh, the same deployment process that's happening with the production. And uh, so, how we how, how we fix the last last failure, the last last problem, the lack of monitoring? We do that with the great respect towards our application or the services we have. We come to them and ask them, "How are you?" And our services and our application actually treat us with equal respect, and they respond to us. And they don't like just just make simple and fine things. They actually tell us how they feel. They tell us whether they can connect connect their dependencies. They tell us whether they uh, their caches are having up to date data. They tell us whether the number of exceptions uh, that were happening in the last period of time is, is, is doing well. So. Uh, we are actually implementing checks, implementing tests inside of the, of the services. The idea is tremendously simple. We have HTTP RESTful thing, so I will do it in this context, but, but the idea can be lifted up into any environment, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And we create a separate endpoint, which is called service status. And by going to this endpoint, we are basically asking service for a <coughs> state. And the service responds with the list of the monitors, or the list of the checks that they perform on our behalf. Each check, has a name, so we can reference it. It has a status saying like, okay, this check is passing, uh, failed, it's failing, or warning, things like uh, something's going wrong, but it's not detrimental. 
and it has a message. A message that uh, is a, a message from the past, from somebody who wrote the test into anybody who is actually running it right now. It tells what can be the business impact, what can be done to, to fix it, uh, or some more details on the failure, like what's, what, what's the actual source, source of it. And we constantly check the service status of all the applications in our infrastructure. All of them have exactly the same, uh, same endpoint, and, and our not just infrastructure, not just server. It's constantly going there and saying, like, how are you, how are you, how are you? This allows us to basically run the tests all the time, so we know how our services are performing over time. Moreover, we are also logging the responses of that. So if the failures are happening always at the same period of time, we'll know about it. This is a very simple idea. This is something that you can actually implement in a couple of minutes into your code and add it there, and you will have, have it available. Hooking it into Nudges is, is extra and will take a little bit more time because you need to have some more infrastructure. But that's, that's all. Um, but this, this, this idea is, is pretty useful for us. First, first of all, we use it during deployment. We use it during deployment to prove uh, that whatever we are uh, deploying can uh, reliably connect to all the dependencies, that it can uh, reliably perform its, its function. So we want our deployment to carry on uh, until uh, the first set of servers we deploy to will pass this test. Uh, this basically saves us from the from the contract changes between different uh, different environments because whatever we are releasing right now was was checked against uh, like working with other other, other services. Uh, secondly, it's the basis for the monitoring, so we constantly check uh, check the state of them. Uh, thirdly, it's also um, thirdly, it's also uh, I lost it. I should find this equation. Uh, it's also performing a warm up during the, the, the deployment because as we are uh, as we are checking all the functionalities, all the things, we are also uh, warming up each part of the application. And uh, because it's consistent, it's also allowing us to go and find the root cause of the, of the issue. We don't need to manually do a checklist, like, oh, this could go wrong, or this could go wrong. Uh, performing one single request will tell us a lot about this, this one single application. And because it's consistent across multiple ones, if my dependency is failing, I can go to this dependency and ask about its status, and it will tell me more. Where is the root cause? This uh, significantly uh, decreases the debugging time if something goes wrong in production or even like in the CI environment. So we deploy. And then when we deploy, we also take advantage of one extra stack, which is centralized logging. That's tremendously important for, for microservices infrastructure in particular. Every our service, every application in our infrastructure logs into one central database. This allows us to do correlation between the events in one place with the events in the other place. And very often, the, the, the issues we are having are, are due to some, 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 some wired uh, interactions between different services. Other thing about our login is that it's semantically rich. So our login messages are not a line of text. They're actually events, or you can think of them as an object, and each field of this object is strongly packed. It has a couple of advantages uh, over a single line of text. First of all, you don't need to manually uh, format this, 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 this log. You don't need to tell, tell the log what was there. Uh, we, what we log is just the whole, whole object. For so for example, I will log the uh, whole request object, or whole, ex whole exception object. And <coughs> the exception object or the request object will change. All the extra fields will be added to log uh, immediately. So for the for the, for, for case of the exception, I will have not only the things I decided, like the message and the stack trace, but I will have also the stack trace of the inner exception or the uh, any extra fields that could be added to the, to the exception object. And that's like another, another thing that this centralized log is another thing that helps tremendously in the value. I have to uh, say that we are probably overloading, but the case is that every time we try to load less, uh, we regret it in a very short amount of time. Uh, it's expensive to have more logs, but at the time of failure or at the time of something happening wrong, having uh, extensive logs helps a lot. I have a separate talk about logging in the blog post, so. Uh, I encourage you to, to look into, it, into that later on if you're interested. So we deploy, and it should be shown to the users, right? 
Not exactly, and that's exactly, we are doing very much the same thing that the guys of the testing in production. We feature switch, switch actually everything. Every, every, every significant change in the product will be feature switched and deployed in the off state. Uh, so it's, it's not visible to the user, it's not affecting our customers. The good benefit of having this, this feature flag uh, is that it allows engineers to have a full control of their, over the deployment process. Because now product doesn't care whether we do 10 releases a day or one release every, every, every second week. They, they do care uh, to have their changes as, as soon as possible. But we can do interim releases with a small changes in the, in the meantime. And, and nobody is, is affected by it. No, no customer is affected by it. Also because we make them enable not on the per service basis, but we make them enable per request basis. It's extremely easy uh, to show in production how the particular feature is behaving right now. What's the current state of the implementation? We can actually deploy the feature that are only partially implemented. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we can also decide to roll out the, uh, the particular risk change into 1% of the users, on, on or only to a subset of the users. Uh, often for the very risky changes, we round up how many users affected by this change. So first we start with 1%, 1% or 5%, 10%, and we watch how it, how it changes our metrics and how it affects actually uh, our users. And that single thing, uh, was one of the, of the like, biggest cultural changes that enables many, many others, other ones. Because by, by starting with the, with the hidden state, we got like, like, uh, buy-in from business to do deployments uh, more often and to have real control over the deployment. And the same process happens again. We take learning from the metrics and, and we have new why, new questions, new things to uh, uh, to experiment on and to, to, to build. So the talk, the name of the talk was test uh, uh, at open table, and I was more going through the deployment pipeline with the different different highlights uh, I wanted to share with you. Uh, and the, like the way I view the tests at our company is not with the perspective of the unit tests or the acceptance tests or integration tests for that matter. The way I view it is more with the experiments. Um, over the features, so we do more want to know why we're doing something and what are the expected outcomes. And uh, with that, allowing uh, people to, to have innovation plan, to be able actually to perform the engineering lab uh, initiatives, uh, to have the service status, which means that monitoring is part of the testing. We are not only focusing on testing, but we are putting a lot of emphasis on the monitoring as well. And that the, the, the features are, are the hidden state which is an enabling factor for A-B testing, which is an enabling factor uh, for, for testing in production as well. And we do other types of testing as well, those, those basic ones, which is the and, and acceptance test, uh, but they are more engineering uh, uh, thing than, than the, the program so. uh, If you are interested more in, in some of the topics, I encourage you to go to our blog post, uh, our blog. There are a couple of interesting blog posts. Uh, one of the teams in our company decided to uh, remove all the unit tests. I think that was the, a very good moment in their particular case. So if you would like to read more about this, uh, go there. Same with the logging infrastructure. There's my blog post uh, about uh, the, how, how we do logging uh, from the high people. And many, many other about the experiments we are trying to run in our environment and whether they work or not. Uh, it's available over there. We are recruiting, so if you are uh, London based, come over and speak. Um, I rushed tremendously. I'm sorry if my language was not understandable very much, but are there any questions? Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs>